I want to tell you um, not just <clears throat> about how the new can live with the old, but how the new actually needs the old. And uh, you will, the observant ones among you, will immediately have seen that I'm not dressed in the same way that TED participants normally are. Now, this isn't a conspiracy with Anna. Um, it was planned beforehand. And together with this court dress, when I'm sitting at the table of the House of Commons in the chamber, I wear a silk gown and a horsehair wig. And people occasionally say to me, um, 18th century clothes, and I say, I may wear 18th century clothes, but that doesn't mean to say I've got an 18th century mind. And in Parliament, in my job, and here in this part of London, the past is constantly with us. It dogs our footsteps, walks alongside us, taps us on the shoulder. But it's important not to be the prisoner of history. History should be our inspiration and not our jailer. Take my job as an example. I'm the 49th clerk of the House of Commons since 1363. I'm the principal constitutional advisor to the House. Now, most of my 48 predecessors would recognize my job. Changed a bit, but they'd recognize it. They certainly wouldn't, only of two or three of my predecessors, would recognize the other part of my job, which is chief executive of the House of Commons service of 2,000 people and 224 million budget. But when I write on a bill, soit bayé au seigneur, let it be sent to the House of Lords, in, I write it in Norman French, and in Wigan gown, I take that bill along the corridor to the House of Lords, I can feel people long dead walking alongside me. But at the same time, that bill is on the shared drive between the two public bill offices of the Lords and Commons, using some of the most advanced text handling software in the world, the old lives with the new. When a member of parliament goes into the chamber of the House of Commons, you think that when they get to the bar, they bow to the speaker. They don't. They're actually bowing to the altar in St. Stephen's Chapel, a few yards away from the modern chamber of the House of Commons, where the House sat from 1547, and they're bowing to the altar. Again, the old is living with the new. But what's the point, you may say? Well, the crowding presence of those memories and histories, I think, does two things for us. The first is that in a changeable world, in the buffeting of politics and parliament, history does give us reference points. And we know that from our own lives. Human beings coping with the riptides and storms of life need an emotional harbor. They need points of reference in order to be able to cope. And it's the same, I think, in the hurly-burly of parliamentary and political life. And if you have that dignified framework, it is much easier to make worthwhile change because you have the confidence and reassurance of the framework. Second, and much more important, are the voices of history. They constantly call to us, and we've heard of one already there behind me on that bitterly cold January day, 30th of January, 1649, Charles I stepped out to his death. And he'd asked that morning his servant to give him a second shirt, because he said, by reason the season is so sharp, as will probably make me shake, which some observers may imagine proceeds from fear. I fear not death. It is not terrible to me. They kept the king waiting here from 10 in the morning to 2 in the afternoon. And his last words to the executioner were, stay for the sign, because he wanted to pray, and he thrust out his hands, and the axe fell. Perhaps we can still hear that faint voice of the king on the scaffold saying, I go from a corruptible crown to an incorruptible. But there are much louder voices, and they come from people who struggled and bled, whose bl blood is on the stones of Westminster, of London, People who struggled for a free parliament. No taxation without representation. Reform of the franchise. Votes for women. And those voices are constantly with us. And do you know, what really fires me up, what makes me dare anything, is when people say to me, ah, I'm not really interested in politics. I don't usually vote. And I say to them, right, so that means you're not interested in peace and war, the water you drink, the air you breathe, your right to a fair trial, 
your children's future, even whether your children have a future. I'm enough of a realist. Parliaments are never going to be popular. Slagging off parliaments is a national sport all around the world. But let's just keep that for light relief, because parliaments are also the aspirations, the focus of the aspirations of free people. In a fortnight's time, I shall have been at the House of Commons for 40 years. Too long, I hear you say. But that first morning in July 1972, I opened my desk drawer, and there was an issue provided by a grateful taxpayer, an issue quill pen, an eloquent voice of history. But throughout my service at the House of Commons, I have never lost my passion for Parliament. And I've always advocated a virtuous triad. If you understand something, it's a natural human emotion to value it. And if you value it, you will come to own it. And that's what we have to try and achieve, because parliaments are not for parliamentarians. They're for citizens. Understand, value, own. That's really worthwhile. And if we achieve it, it will be with those voices of history ringing in our ears.